All right, here we go. Now we're live. Nobody's here yet, but that's okay. So we'll wait a few minutes for these uh, Instagram to go live. But for if you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, we're picking up with a question and answer session that I uh, started last week, trying to get some some uh, questions for, and I collected a bunch, and I didn't get to record last week. But uh, what's happening? Oh, I see Scott Tixier is here. What's up, Scott? Uh, and, and some others. But uh, I collected some questions last week um, on here on, on Instagram, and I'll try to go through as many as I can uh, before I have to jump back in and start uh, teaching again. Um, official Neil 04, hi, what's up? And uh, we're going to kind of try to go through as many of these questions as we can. So we'll see uh, what happens. If you have a question, feel free to put it down in the comments below or here in the live stream. Otherwise, I'm going to I'm going to jump in with some of these questions that we got from last week. Um, thanks for watching the video, Scott. Appreciate that, man. Uh, hope Chicago isn't too cold. I think that's where you are right now. Um, but uh, we're going to jump into some of these questions. So the first question, I'm going to start with this one uh, from Chloe Potter one. She says, uh, do you have a method for incorporating pedal tones into your soloing? Um, I think that I don't really have a method, but um, I think that trying to just start to hear uh, that register, so starting to play uh, in that register, use that register for your improvisation in terms of, I try to use it when I'm thinking maybe about how to use it for an introduction or something like that, or use it uh, when trying to create an arrangement using pedal tones. You could check out someone like Marshall Jilks who does an amazing job of doing that. Uh, I think maybe that's a little obvious if you're a trombone player that he does those things uh, with the pedal tones. But in terms of just like playing lines and then jumping down the pedal tones, I'm not sure that I necessarily have a method other than uh, practicing major scales like alternating with the root. So uh, like B flat, then C, B flat, D, B flat, E flat, B flat, F, B flat, G, B flat, A, B flat, B flat, but doing it with a pedal in between. Uh, there's another video on YouTube where I kind of went through that whole thing. So you might jump over to YouTube and try to find that video. Pedal Scale Workout, I think it's called. Uh, you could check that out. Um, so Pedal Scale Workout is, will be a good place to start if you're trying to do that. Uh, <clears throat> thank, if you're here live on YouTube, or not on YouTube, Instagram, thanks for being here. Feel free to drop in any questions as uh, we go through this. I'm going through some Q&A questions that... Uh, I gathered last week uh, on Instagram. So uh, that was the first one from Chloe Potter one. We're going to move on to the next one here. Uh, this is from Anthony Castillo Jazz 2019. Uh, the question is, would you suggest practicing two five ones in every key and being able to improvise over them? Uh, the, I think the answer there is a resounding yes. So if you want to learn how to play jazz harmony, the two five one is one of the most basic and fundamental uh, patterns of harmony and understanding how to voice lead through there, what kind of chord scales go along with those, and then transcribing actual language that happens on those chords, actual language like listening to Freddie Hubbard and Bud Powell and all these guys play two five ones and understand that the two five one is really just a five one and that the, the two is just creating more harmonic motion um, is a good place to start with two five ones. Uh, you can go and just shed the arpeggios. You can shed scales, but going to the language is uh, the thing that we want to do. The thing I would suggest to you, and then being able to do it in any key. He asked about twelve keys. Oh, no, he didn't. But you should be able to do it in twelve keys so that you're completely fluid, completely able to play in whatever key. Um, you want. That's why we do things in 12 keys. It also expands your ears. Uh, if you can't do something in the key of B major, uh, what happens when you start playing Cherokee and you have to play in B major? Uh, I don't know why we neglect these keys, but sometimes we do. So 12 keys, two five ones. Yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, so let's keep on rolling here. If you're live on Instagram, feel free to drop in any other questions. We're going through some questions that we collected last week. Um, Oh, there's a question here. Let's jump to a question from the live stream here on Instagram from Luke. What's up, Luke? 
He says, I remember hearing you say that when learning new tunes, you like to listen and try to be able to sing the tune. At what point do you get the lead sheet in front of you? I don't get the lead sheet in front of me until I either get stumped and I can't figure something out or I want to check my lead sheet against another lead sheet, another source. Uh, so I try not to look at a lead sheet. There's plenty of tunes that I've never looked at the music for um, and, then, and just know because I know them, not because I looked at a, a piece of music. Because music is not the piece of paper. Music is what we hear, right? And I think sometimes other languages have it have a better idea when you, they separate the words for paper music and aural music. And that kind of is how I think about it. Um, but learning tunes, only if I need to check against a lead sheet uh, because I couldn't figure something out. Um, I just learned Chick Corea's tune, Bud Powell. I've never looked at the lead sheet. I don't know if there is a lead sheet. I'm sure somebody has one, but um, so I hope that answers your question, Luke. But uh, I know that's probably not the answer you wanted to hear. But uh, you, you don't need to look at a lead sheet as long as you learn the tune uh, as best as you can. So let's keep moving with these questions. Um, we're just going to keep rolling here. So, oh, somebody just wants a shout out. Cam Hastings, what's up? Okay, moving on from the shout out. Oh, this was a great question. I did answer this one. Uh, he said, real talk, do you prefer F sharp or G flat? Uh, G flat is definitely the way to go. I love the key of G flat. Love E flat minor, G flat. I've got a bunch of tunes I've written that are in those keys. I like D flat. F sharp is cool. If he's talking about the note F sharp, it's a good note, especially in D major. I don't know why I think about it like that, but that's what it is. Um, let's keep moving here. Okay, this is from Willie.om. It says, best guide to practice improv with chord changes. Uh, the best guide to learn chord changes is to learn how to play the piano. Learn how to play an instrument uh, that involves chords. Uh, learn how to navigate the harmony in an, in, with an instrument that navigates harmony. So whether that's guitar or bass or uh, piano, learning one of those and how chord changes work, how voicings work, how one leads to the next, all those things uh, will become very re readily apparent to you if you're a single note player like most trombonists are uh, to try to um, move into playing something with a chordal instrument. It's going to really be helpful uh, for you in terms of understanding chord changes. But in terms of a single note learning chord changes, the thing I always have people go through, especially at the beginning, is to learn the root melody sing the root melody, uh, and then we play root to third. It's because there's only two options. It's either major or minor. So we do, for example, it's either quarter notes or half notes, depending on the tune and how many chords there are per bar. But So root melody, and then root third, then root seventh, and then we put together like a walking bass line kind of thing that goes root seventh, root third, root seventh, root third. Uh, my students and my performance fundamentals class which is our first year class uh, at UNT will um, validate that I do make them do this so it's a uh, root seventh root third and go through that pattern why do I focus on that pattern because if you just do arpeggios it just becomes too much of a technical challenge sometimes especially at faster speeds or jumping around it's ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba and to me it doesn't really it doesn't really um, it's not helpful. So I just have people do this root seventh, root third, because it gets to the important notes, number one, and number two, it allows you to connect them together. And number three, it kind of sounds like a walking bass line, and it starts you getting into the habit of improvising uh, like a certain rhythm, like quarter notes, and uh, going through the changes, delineating the harmony, and all of that. So that's where I would start, walking bass lines, quarter notes. That way you don't have to think about the rhythm. You're just playing a constant rhythm and uh, you're getting through the changes. You're focusing root seventh, root third, if you want a practical and instant way to learn any, any tune. All right, from B Ice 3000 favorite ITF memory? Um, my favorite ITF memory, um, I'm thinking he's referring to this last summer, and this last summer uh, ITF was in was in, uh, where was it? In Indiana. And at a state 
school, not a state school, at a Ball State, that's what I'm going for. Uh, a friend of mine, Chris Van Hoff, was running the festival, and we, Chris and I went to Eastman together back in the 2007-8-9 time frame, and uh, so my favorite memory was, one, getting to reconnect and play a concert with him, my old teacher, uh, Mark Kellogg, who was on the concert, and we got to pay tribute to J.J. Johnson and got to stand next to and with my current new colleague, Tony Baker, and also with some of my trombone heroes, Michael Deese and, Ra and Ryan Keverly. So kind of coalescing all of those people into one room and playing with them and getting to play for J.J.'s wife, Carolyn, uh, was a pretty special uh, evening and one that I won't forget. So if I had to pick one memory from ITF, and this is ITF, uh, 28, 2019, this, this year, uh, it would, would it be that J.J. Johnson tribute concert that we did. Uh, it was pretty special. And uh, I think that the stream of that concert is still online on the ITF um, Facebook. Yeah, ITF Facebook. So go to ITF's Facebook, International Tremone Festival, uh, and you can find that. So let's keep going. Uh, if you're just joining, we're going through some Q&A questions that I gathered last week. And if you want to drop one of your own questions down below in the Instagram live stream, we'll get to those. Otherwise, I'm going to keep rolling with the questions that we have here. But uh, here's one from Kata Porum. Uh, some tips for bass trombonists that play tuba sheets. Um, I'm guessing he or she means that your bass trombone is playing a tuba part. Um, and so my suggestion would be get really good at reading ledger lines, I guess, and try to play with a tuba-like sound. So that means big, round, fat, not strong and blatty like a typical bass trombonist. I'm just kidding. Not every bass trombonist is loud and blatty. But uh, I don't know. you got to get good at reading below the bass clef and playing with a warm, round sound if you're trying to replace a tuba. I'm not sure if that's the case you're trying to replace a tuba. But there's a lot of really great, you know, bass trombonist I would send you to for more specific information. I only play bass trombone when I have to play bass trombone, basically. Um, so it's not my area of specialty, I would say. So I'm going to just move on to the next question. All right. Best advice on building lines in improvisation. Thanks for the question. This is from Brant Luvano, I think is uh, how you say his name. Um, so Brant, um, Transcribe jazz language. That's the answer to your question. Listen to great jazz soloists to get the knowledge of what those things are supposed to sound like. A lot of times students uh, want to learn what notes to play, but not how to play the notes. Uh, you have to have the knowledge of how to play the notes before you can make the notes sound how we want them to sound. So if you're not listening to jazz all the time and you want to be playing jazz, you're doing something wrong. You should be listening to the language and trying to learn the language as best we can um, and learn lines <clears throat> from players that you'd like to listen to. So if it was me, I would send you to J.J. Johnson, Steve Davis, Curtis Fuller, and try to transcribe those that language and then implement it. Oh, okay. What's up, Flores? How are you? Hello. Um, so that's my best advice. Transcribe language from people that play great lines if you want to um, build lines and improvisation. Once you have a solid foundation, well, one of my students this semester was um, working on Bob Brookmeyer. Why were we working on Bob Brookmeyer? Because we wanted to try to expand his sense of phrasing. And so by going to somebody like Bob Brookmeyer or uh, Jerry Mulligan, who he often plays with, is they have just like a totally different sense, a much longer, broader sense of phrasing than you quote unquote generally might get from um, like a JJ or a Steve Davis. But those would be the places I would start, Brant. Transcribe, transcribe, and then transcribe some more after you're done transcribing. And uh, once you've learned those solos, you've written them down, you can see and look at the lines. You can see how they fit over different chord changes. You can see uh, what scales they're playing or what eighth notes they're playing or triplets or 16th notes. So that's what I usually do. We usually sing solos first then learn to play them, and then at the very end, write them down, and then go for all the nuances after that. So kind of four steps to so transcribe, transcribe, and transcribe some more. And after you transcribe, you should go and listen even deeper, more deeply. All right, moving to the next question. This one's from Beardy Bone. 
These are all Instagram handles, by the way. So if you want to look up anybody, this is Beardy Bone. Daily ear training exercises or drills that a classical player could get into. Um, a couple places I would send you. Oh, good. Brant is here. Oh, nice. Yeah, we're, uh, I'm going to be in Reno in March. Uh, I haven't announced those tour dates yet. Uh, that'll be coming soon. But um, yes, March, Reno. Uh, we can we can get together for a lesson. Um, daily drills for ear training. Okay, so the first thing is you need to be able to hear intervals. So if you don't, there's plenty of websites and apps where you can do ear training on intervals. And then you want to do ear training on triads and then maybe seventh chords. And then if you want to get more into jazz, then you got to start to do ear training about like extensions and hearing different types of qualities. And a great resource that I've used with my students is an app called Harmony Cloud. And I know that Stefan Harris, the great vibist, is a part of that, the, the development of that. And um, it's really great because it's a, kind of like a random chord generator in a way because it jumps around. You can set the parameters of what you want to hear. So I would use your available resources if you're a classical player that's trying to get into playing jazz and doing ear training. It's going to be... Um, downloading apps like Harmony Cloud or other ones that will test first intervals, then triads and seventh chords, and then just chord progressions. Uh, and then the best way to learn jazz ear training is to transcribe and learn tunes by ear. You use just keep on going to it, even though it's hard and it sucks and it takes a long time. The more you do it, the easier it gets and uh, the better it's going to be for you. And um, so just keep at it. It's going to be frustrating at first, but just just keep going because once you get it, uh, it's way more rewarding. So just keep on trucking along. And if you can do that daily stuff, uh, you can use, check out the Harmony Cloud app. It's really good. It can, you can listen for bass notes. You can listen for major, minor, seventh chords. It's really, really great. So I'll send you there to that Harmony Cloud app for ear training. Uh, if you're here on Instagram, feel free to drop in a question. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to go through these uh, collected questions um, from last week uh, on Instagram. Um, this is an interesting one. This is from Arnie. Arnie lives in Switzerland. Is ear training useful for singing? Um, yeah, of course, ear training is useful for singing. This is from Flores, who's in here in the live stream now. Um, if you can't hear intervals, how are you going to? be able to relate to the musicians or major or minor and learn how music works. I think being playing any instrument or singing, uh, developing your ear is one of the single most important things and being able to know what it is that you're hearing if you want to perform on a high level. So no matter what instrument you play, you should be developing your ear uh, and being able to know intervals, triads, seventh chords, color tones, uh, over dominant chords or over any any chord those those kind of fundamental ear training things are going to be important for you and for anyone who's looking to develop their musicianship so back to this question uh, from Arnie a great trombonist he lives in Finland we met in Switzerland la this past was it April the spring um, he says thoughts on using the term BAM instead of jazz that's an interesting question um, I continue to use the word jazz only because uh, that's colloquial, colloquially how people understand uh, in culture outside of our kind of peer group um, what it is. It represents music that is mostly improvised and often has a swing beat or something like that to someone who's outside of the industry. Um, but I think there's so much evidence of artists throughout the years that don't like that word and that uh, it refers to a system of oppression. And I'm, I'm with those people. I mean, I don't think that I can totally, I don't think I can totally um, ignore the word jazz just because um, our program is UNT Jazz Studies. I am the jazz trombone instructor. That word is kind of baked into a lot of things. But I do support those artists, and I think it is black American music. There's no denying that that is the truth from my, my point of view. Um, my favorite musicians, you know, Duke Ellington, 
JJ Johnson, Curtis Fuller, Slide Hampton, and the list could keep going on. And the, so I, uh, I think it is that. And uh, I support those people. But I don't know that I can totally stop using that word just because that's what people um, know this music as and my job title, etc. cetera. But um, if we could move in another direction, find another name, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be open to that conversation. But uh, I'm going to keep rolling on these questions here. I've got just a couple more minutes before I have to jump in and do another um, uh, lesson, teach a little bit today. Uh, okay, this is from S-A-A-N-T-I-B, Santi, Santib. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. But he says, uh, the best gig bag for two trombones. I th think there's only one that I know of, and that's, I think it's Cronkite, and it's like a double trombone gig bag. I've never seen another one. I would guess you could probably use a, a Pelican case and get it custom fitted to have um, two trombones in it, I guess. But um, I'm really trying to design a really good one trombone gig bag first before we get to two. Uh, and I'm trying to find a company that wants to work with me on that, but I haven't found one yet. So if any of you or you know anyone that wants to help develop a case, I have an idea, a couple ideas actually. I um, would love to get that out into the world because most cases aren't that good, especially if you have to fly a lot. Next question. From, this is from Luis. Uh, any advice about doubling? Uh, bass trombone mouthpiece feels tiny after playing tuba and tone suffers. You know, I'm not necessarily the best doubler. I double when I need to. I mostly stick to one trombone, and so... Uh, the best advice I've heard other people give about this topic is that if you want to double well, you need to go back and forth between the horns like in all phases of your practice. So like when you're warming up, play long tones on the tuba and then on the trombone and then go back to the tuba, do articulation, go to the trombone, do articulation and get used to the switching back and forth. And I think you have to play each instrument like it's that instrument, not try to play trombone like a tuba player or tuba player like a trombone just kind of you have to have a totally different almost um, multiple personality for lack of a better way to put it where you're switching gears and you're just moving to this other thing you know you're going and you're now you're a bass trombonist now you're a trumpet player uh, one of my students at UNT he plays you know trumpet tuba trombone and he's switching back and forth all the time and he doesn't seem to have any trouble uh, just because if you approach each thing as its own separate thing it can be um that's the best way I can think about how to do it. But for me, it's never been my calling that to be a doubler, to be a person that doubles really well, uh, even more than bass trombone and tenor trombone. I did play tuba in high school, and so I'm better actually at tuba than at uh, bass trombone at the, mo at the moment. Uh, question, do you need a designer for the case or some type of engineers? I don't know exactly, really, um, probably. Probably need help with a designer. Uh, I don't exactly know what goes all into prototyping a product like that. I have ideas for the design in general, but at, um, any help would be, would be appreciated. Send me a DM and uh, see if we can work something out or if you know someone or send me in a direction. I appreciate that, Flores. Much appreciated. Uh, so that, that's my uh, doubling advice. Uh, you should find for someone that really specializes in it. Um, there's some people that do it really well and they're very passionate about the doubling and they've studied it and they've really like put all, gone all into the doubling. Um, hey Nils, what's happening? Oh, that's very nice of you. I'm glad, I'm glad you uh, enjoy the music. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're, if you're on Instagram right now, we're going through some collection, a collection of questions from last week. Uh, that I didn't get a chance to answer because I had to go to Austin, Texas last minute this last weekend. Uh, so I didn't get to do that Q&A that I was planning to do. Um, here's a great question from Nils. Any other recommendations on apps that help uh, composers? Hmm. Well, I like that Harmony Cloud app. Um, for composers, um, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure if I have anything else. For composers unless you're talking about just maybe um, like something like Evernote so you can collect uh, pictures of like little score bits or take different pictures of different people's scores or uh, do voice memos in there so I use Evernote that's what I'm using right now to collect the 
questions from here and then put it over here on my computer. Otherwise, I'm not, I don't know about any composition specific apps, but uh, any like random, random chord generator kind of thing can be cool. I used to download these different um, like synth random chord generators or like synth arpeggiators and stuff like that um, that are free or they used to be free at least in the app store. So uh, those are kind of interesting. Oh, there you go. Is that, I'm not sure if that's a, is that an app, Michael? I thought that was just a website. Website. He wrote uh, IML, IMSLP, which has the, the score study uh, for like anything that's in the public domain, I'm pretty sure, maybe even beyond that, um, for score, score study, at least in terms of wanting to, you know, learn more as a composer. Yeah, it's just a website. That's what I thought. Um, moving forward, I got just a couple more minutes here. Um, this is from Trombone Mouse, Trombone, I, can't, I don't know, Trombone, M-A-U-S, contemporary trombonists that are pushing the, pushing the boundaries. Well, uh, some of the ones that are my favorites, Michael Deese, Ryan Keberly, Marshall Jilks, uh, and then those three come to mind. I mean, I feel like Robin Eubanks is still trying to do interesting things. And, uh, you know, he was at least we're doing all the different electronic stuff that he was doing. Um, in terms of jazz specifically or improvised music and trombone. Other than my peers who are doing cool things and just playing like kind of straight ahead music, um, I'd be interested to hear what else, you know, is out there. Oh. Michael Clement, he's also saying that uh, there is an app from I, for IMSLP. I was uh, wrong, which is happens fairly often. Um, but so check that out if you want to find as many scores as you can. Um, but contem other contemporary trombonists, you know, I, I'm really still a huge fan of Steve Steve Davis and Steve Teray and Wycliffe Gordon, I don't know if they count as pushing the boundaries, but uh, they can do stuff that I can't do. So I would say that's pushing boundaries to me. All right, here's another question. This is from, oh, I think this is a, it says port one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, but that might be a fake account name. I don't know, but it's a good question. It says, when transcribing, what is your process for incorporating the artist's style into your playing? This is actually a really great question and one that uh, I talk with my students about a lot. So what I like to do is take part of a solo and use it as a kind of like copy and paste into uh, an exercise. So meaning this, like if you transcribe a blues solo, I might say, all right, let's take the, the last four bars of that chorus and plug it in, right? So we're gonna improvise the first eight bars of the blues chorus, and then we're gonna play that lick, and then we're gonna improvise the first eight bars of the, another blues chorus, and then play that same lick again, and then do the same thing a couple more times to try to get that bit of vocabulary uh, into our brain and into our psyche beyond just like I'm having to plug it in, so it just kind of occurs to us naturally. Um, and so we then improvise into it and then we improvise out of it, right? So you're getting contextual for how that piece of vocabulary works and sounds. So we'll do that there and then we take another piece and do it there, take another piece and do it again, take another piece and go do it again. Um, so uh, that, that would be my advice in terms of taking an artist and then plugging in the vocabulary. And then the next step beyond that even is to recognize like what are the top five things that make you sound like, or that make uh, like J.J. Johnson sound like J.J. Johnson? There's a number of bits of vocabulary, falls, stylistic things that are gonna make it sound like that person. Uh, so between those stylistic things and then doing this plug and play with the different transcriptions, um, that's gonna help you incorporate the style. And this person is, I think, talking more specifically about the style. So you have to you know, really listen for the style to start with and think about all the different ways that notes are stylized. You know, there, <clears throat> you can stylize a note both with um, vibrato, glisses, in and out of the notes, the length of the note, the articulation. There's just so many ways that you can do that. Um, and uh, anyway, that's how I would do that. 
Uh, thanks, Flores. Appreciate that. Oh, from the early PNJ days. Nice. Uh, did we ever meet at one of the shows? I haven't toured with them in a while, but I know that they're still going strong. Postmodern Jukebox. Uh, another question from Nils. Do you sing in your mind when improvising, or do you think about the changes or licks, etc.? I think about the rhythm, and I think about how the rhythm relates to the chord changes. So if, if I'm thinking, you know, this tempo, it might be... I'm just thinking of the rhythm, and then I'm fitting the rhythm and playing the notes that go to the, with the changes of that rhythm, if that makes sense. So I'm sort of singing, but knowing the changes and following my ear and trusting my, my instincts uh, when it comes to that, for sure. All right, I got two minutes. Drop any last minute questions here. I'm gonna to have to jump off in just a second. How do you think technology will impact the future of trombone performance? Oh, that's a very good question too. Um, hmm, I don't know. Um, I think integrating electronics could be uh, more and more popular. I've been doing that since I was in college on and off, uh, incorporating electronics. I think there's gonna be more and more easy ways to learn trombone. Uh, it would be great if we could use that technology to like get more people to play the instrument, for example, or at least know what it is and not think it's a cello or a violin. That would be great. Um, help get trombone back into the front of bands and help people think of trombone as a solo instrument and not as something that's just a goofy instrument or sounds loud and blatty. You know that that would be that would be fantastic. I think that there's a lot of great content creators out there that are using trombone and you know trying to get it out into the world so i think i don't exactly know what he means by technology or what part of technology this person uh, his screen name is uh, at t-r-o-m-b-o tromboise i don't know why i spelled that out but uh hopefully uh, i think it will be a positive overall for the trombone and we're back that was it we made it all the way through so thanks for being here. I'm planning to do more of these over the next couple of months. Um, so check the Instagram stories to submit questions uh, when it comes time. And uh, we can always jump in on these live streams as well. But that kind of was a broad, multi-topic situation. But uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, Nils, you're very welcome. And all, everyone else, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be back soon. Send me a DM with any other questions you didn't get answered yet. And uh, we'll be back really soon. So have a great day and uh, see you later.